Uh, warm welcome to the session. Uh, this is an effort that we have started uh, with the uh, University of Southampton a few months ago, and we had a consultation meeting uh, between the seats representatives. And we came up with our idea to come up with a framework uh, to be implemented in order to develop water resilience approaches for the seats. And this is a very timely issue for the COP26 that is going to end the negotiation. We hope countries will agree uh, in a target that will help uh, develop resiliency, particularly to water. And um, my name is Anil Mistra. I'm chief of section hydrology, uh, system and water scarcity at UNESCO. And um, I would like to welcome you in this uh, program. Thank you very much for all the panelists and speaker. I will introduce uh, all the speakers and panelists um, after we have opening remark from Dr. Abu Omani, Director of the Water Science Division and Secretary of Intergovernmental Hydrological Program. Abu, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Anil. Uh, dear friend, dear colleagues, um, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I'm really delighted to, to be with you and to, to make these few remarks on behalf of UNESCO. Um, to welcome you uh, to this event on climate vulnerability and water resilience for the small islands and development states, and also to thank you for making time to be with us. Uh, we all know that seeds are extremely vulnerable to climate change, posing to some of them ex existential threat. In that regard, we need to act boldly and urgently. As you know, according to the recently released report of IPCC, the sixth assessment report, drying trends will persist in several seed regions, and also the increasing of temperature will further exacerbate heat stress. Also, more intense tropical cyclones are projected. In addition to that, sea level rise will continue to increase with consequences on groundwater plus the massive salt intrusion. Among the different impacts of climate change within the seas, hydroclimatic hazards and more frequent coastal floods are the most devastating and represent a big threat to water security within the seas. The strategic plan of nine phase of the UNESCO Intergovernmental Hydrocolor Program on science for a water secure world in a changing environment is aligned with UNESCO's commitment to strengthen the effort of seeds to achieve the sustainable development for which we know water will play a key role. The RGB strategy plan will enhance UNESCO's contribution to the Samoa pathway, to the SDGs, including SDG 6 and also SDG 13 on climate action, as well as the Sandai framework on disaster risk reduction. IHP, in collaboration with the University of Southampton, is carrying out a multidisciplinary study aiming at establishing a framework to assessing seeds' vulnerabilities to hydroclimatic hazards. This framework will contribute to support seeds in increasing their response capacity and to enhance their preparedness facing hydroclimatic hazard through a water resilience approach considering hydrological, climatic, social, and economic perspectives. Two workshops on the study have been already organized with the participation of experts from SIDS, and the outcome of these meetings will be present later during this event. So I would like to thank all of you for your contribution to the discussion, which will help to shape the framework 
for assessing hydroclimatic vulnerabilities facing seeds. Finally, I would like to thank the University of Southampton and all my colleagues within the water division who have contributed in organizing this event. So we are looking forward for fruitful discussions. And as I said, we need bold actions and urgent and decisive action to support seeds in facing climate change impact. And as I said, some of them even facing existential threat. So thank you. Back to you, Anil. Thank you very much, Abu, for reiterating UNESCO's commitment to strengthen efforts of seeds, particularly to achieve their SDGs uh, through water and making water resilient seeds. Uh, with that, um, and also informing us that we will uh, implement those uh, efforts in ISP 9. And with that, I would like to inform you that we have uh, um, distinguished panelists today who will, who will intervene in science and policy session, uh, which starts right now. And we have uh, three distinguished speakers who will talk about some of the uh, studies, some of the uh, issues that has been discussed during the works of that Abu mentioned earlier, hydroclimatic hazard in seeds, assessing the governance, governance framework for resilience to climate change risk in seeds, and towards a water resilience framework for climate vulnerability in seeds. So without further delay, I would like to invite a uh, professor and friend, um, Justin Seffel from University of Geography and Environmental Sciences, University of Southampton, who is also part of the team to co-organize this event. And Justin already uh, working with us on several other projects, including flood and drought early warning system and platform. And he will now present climate and water security risk in small island developing states. Justin, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Anil. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about this work. And thank you for everyone um, joining this morning or afternoon or the middle of the night, wherever you are. So. I'm going to talk briefly uh, about some of the climate and water security risks that um, small island developing states are experiencing are, and are expected to experience even further uh, under climate change and some of the approaches that we've been developing around risk assessments to try to address some of these challenges. And you can see that we're talking about a, a global problem across from the Caribbean um, through Africa, the Indian Ocean and out to Southeast Asia and the Pacific covering some 52 uh, SIDS um, and a population of 65 million people. So just about the same uh, as the UK where uh, I am and many of you are today. Um, and these SIDS are vulnerable to climate and water hazards for a number of reasons, um, primarily because they are geographically remote, uh, often spatially dispersed within uh, an island state as well, and often low lying. Um, and climate change is expected to have a really disproportionate impact on SIDS and already is in many ways, um, especially via water security. And that's uh, often because those islands have quite complex and often limited water resources that, that make them vulnerable to, to climate change. Next slide, please. So here are some examples of some of those hydroclimatic risks that are um, really important for water security in, in SIDS. So there are, there are some obvious ones like tropical cyclones and storms that were mentioned before, um, obviously causing infrastructure damage, loss of life in some cases through, uh, through wind damage and, and flooding and inundation. And this is affecting inland, this is affecting coastal regions as well. Uh, and we also have hazards from tsunamis as well in some, um, some areas. On the other side of the kind of climatic spectrum, we also have impacts of drought, leading to impacts on agriculture, obviously impacts on water resources directly, uh, and leading to things like salinization of uh, water resources and, and agriculture, the soils that are uh, so important for that as well. Um, and as I said, some of these islands are quite tenuous in terms of their water resources because of the reliance on shallow freshwater lenses, so shallow groundwater, that is often quite connected to, to seawater and with sea level rise, that becomes um, quite a problem in terms of making those water resources sustainable for the populations 
of those islands. Next slide, please. So under expected climate change, there are a range of uh, impacts that are expected um, in terms of changes in precipitation. Um, so as was mentioned before, many islands are expected to see a substantial decline in freshwater availability as precipitation declines overall in some of these regions. On the other hand, there are some places such as the Western Pacific Islands and islands in the northern Indian Ocean that may actually see an increase in freshwater availability. Um, and often this is going to be challenged because of changes, not just in the overall uh, amount of water, but how it comes as well. So changes in the variability from year to year that's often associated with changes in ENSO, in El Nino and La, La Nina events that's increasing the frequency of, of floods and droughts, especially in places like the South Pacific. Uh, sea level rise is expected to be a real challenge, already is in many places. It's expected to be higher than the global average in many SIDS regions that will lead to and is already leading to salinization, flooding, in some cases permanent inundation, so loss of land, uh, associated erosion and also pressure on ecosystems of various types. And, and in some cases, those ecosystems are providing services to the population, so those are going to be diminished as well. Uh, was, when, was mentioned before by Abu, um, tropical storms are expected to change and then change in, in different ways. So there's projected to be a decrease in the frequency of weaker tropical storms, but an increase in the number of intense cyclones. And as you can imagine, that's going to be associated with increases in extreme precipitation and flooding, so causing even further uh, problems on top of what is happening already. Next slide, please. So how do we go about assessing uh, risks in SIDS? So there are a bunch of key challenges, which I've alluded to a little bit already. Um, one of the key challenges is the diversity of SIDS, um, not only between island states, but also within the islands that make up those, those nations, so those constituent islands. There is a lot of diversity geographically in the landscape, but also in the, in the socioeconomic, sociocultural context as well. So this really requires specific and high resolution risk assessments, not only for current climates, but also for those future climates. And this is challenged because of a lack of existing data on risks. And when that data does exist, it's often fragmented or it's low resolution. So not really resolving the complexity of the islands that make up these, uh, these nations. So some of the key goals in assessing risk is to really capture that diversity from within islands, but also up to the regional scale. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. And to do that, to promote awareness of those risks. Sorry, can we go back one slide? To promote awareness, but also dialogue between islands and nations via a common risk assessment framework and language. And use that to identify, uh, especially the communities that are most risk now and also into the future because things will change and potentially to identify safe areas that have that in current kind of inherent uh, adaptation potential that will allow um, populations to exist uh, as they have done uh, into the future. On the right here is a risk framework, and this is the risk framework that's adopted by the IPCC that takes into account the three major elements of risk. So firstly, the hazard that's coming from climate change or biodiversity loss. Uh, also, the exposure, so what infrastructure and populations are exposed to those hazards. Uh, and also, importantly, is the vulnerability. So what is the range of vulnerabilities of different populations of the infrastructure, of the governance structures as well for these various uh, uh, um, island states? And when you pull all these together, then you can have an assessment of risk. But it requires uh, assessment of each of those and bringing those together into one, um, uh, one whole risk assessment. Next slide, please. So the work that we've been doing at Southampton, and we've called this SIDS at Risk, has really been focused on Pacific Islands. And we developed a, uh, a database that goes some way to uh, addressing um, some of the challenges that I spoke be about before and providing a data set that is going to be shareable and hopefully useful to a whole range of stakeholders. So this is focused on the whole tropical Pacific looking at small islands, that's 5,000 plus islands. We're going down to resolutions of tens or hundreds of meters. So really getting down to the scales that are important in terms of the variability within islands and between islands. Focusing on SIDS, but also overseas territories as well. Using the latest 
hydroclimate hazard data sets. So that's thinking about the climate and the hydrology, the water resources data sets. The latest population data and other infrastructure data, we use a data set from WorldPop, which is based here at Southampton. And looking at these risks and how they change from current into future climates under 1.5 and 2 degree uh, warming and looking across a range of hazards, as I mentioned before in earlier slides. Next slide, please. So in terms of the scales, just to reiterate, we have to look down at the small island scale to really understand the risks across uh, island nations and have to go down to this kind of tens of meter scales. But we also have to think about how we scale this up to the scales of governance and also the scales of the region that allows us to uh, understand to compare between islands and between island nations and actually exchange information uh, between um, different types of risk happening on similar types of islands, but also different types of islands as well. So this scaling up and disaggregation down as well is really important to get the fuller picture uh, across the, the variety and diversity of island nations, particularly in the Pacific here. Next slide, please. So to just give you a few examples of the kind of data sets and the kind of metrics that we're developing in terms of the components of the risk, but also risk and how it's changing as well, I have a few slides to show that and comparing across different types of islands as well. So on the left here, we have an island in, within the Solomon Islands. On the right, we, which is a high island. On the right, we have Kiribati, an atoll island, very low lying. And showing the hazards from landslides, you can see the diversity across the island in terms of high risk areas and low risk areas at the coast. And on the atoll island, very low risk because we have very low elevations. But when you look at other risks, uh, other hazards such as fluvial flooding, you see quite opposite kind of picture, where on the high island you see coastal areas with very high risks, uh, and on low-lying island you see quite dispersed and complex picture of risks. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of exposure, we've been looking, as I said, at, at population, also infrastructure that includes things like health facilities, communication, connectivity, agricultural land, roads is important infrastructure as well. And again, you can see the differences across different island types with these two examples of how these exposure metrics play out spatially, especially in terms of the concentration in populated areas. And when we have some of these low islands, it can be quite dispersed in terms of the exposure across the whole island itself. Next slide, please. Vulnerability, as I said, was, is really important. This is actually very difficult to derive at very high resolution. Um, ideally, this is derived from census information, um, but that can be very uh, difficult to obtain. It can be limited to broader administrative areas, and often it's out of date as well. So um, the approach is often to use simple indicators such as infrastructure per capita, urban area per capita, and so on. And here's some examples across a diversity of islands showing that even though we have aggregation to the island level, we can also see quite diversity across island uh, states. So for example, in Fiji on the bottom right here, you can see a diversity from low vulnerability up to high vulnerability, even within a small proximity within one island state. Next slide, please. Yes, Tim, so you, might these... want, you might want to uh, uh, summarize now as we are running out of time. Thank you. Okay, can we go forward a couple of slides then, please? In one okay. minute. Um, okay, to the last slide here. This is actually an out-of-date um, slide, so apologies for that. Um, so I was going to talk about recommendations and outlook. So it's really important to consider the range of relevant climate and water-related hazards uh, for the islands. And I, as I said before, um, there is a complete range of hazards from one end of the climate spectrum to the other in terms of floods and droughts coming from different angles that we have to consider. It's really important to consider the best sources of data to estimate the hazard, hazard occurrence and exposure as well thinking about local data where it's available, but also global data sets and bringing those together. It's important to identify uh, the different modeling approaches to estimate the hazard probabilities, including duration and severity, and think about how these hazards are going to change and the exposure as well in terms of population and infrastructure is going to change in the future and what types of timescales are really important there. And very importantly is to make sure these assessments draw from and complement existing knowledge and approaches, including indigenous knowledge. And finally, very important to consider how these types of assessments can be used in the short term for decision making, but also long term in terms of policy development and implementation. Thank you, Anil. Back to you. Thank you very much, Justine.
indeed very interesting talk. We wanted to have uh, all the slides presented, but because of the time limit and, and the issues that you have highlighted, I think will come back to us during the Q&A session. Uh, in order not to lose the time, I would like to go to the next uh, speaker, Ms. Daniel Andrande, uh, she is attorney at law, um, is a partner in Geoff Law. She has also served as a consultant to the United Nations Development Program uh, and, and National Environment and Planning Agency. She will tell us today, addressing the governance framework for resilience to climate change risk in seeds. Daniel, thank you very much for joining, uh, sacrificing your morning time. Please go ahead. Thank you, Anil, for that introduction. So I'm going to try and be brief, or as brief as I can be, and I'm going to be talking about um, the governance framework for fresh water. So um, if you could go to the next slide, please. All right, so I won't spend much time on this because I think Justin did a really good job outlining um, some of the peculiar characteristics of SIDS and um, also some of the climate change risks and impacts to SIDS. But something to note is that SIDS are also very diverse in their climatic conditions, their geography, their environment and culture. And this may be something that is attributable to their regional specificities, but is also something that within specific regions as well, you might find um, some SIDS have their own peculiar cultural distinct um, legal frameworks. And so any type of governance approach needs to be flexible and take that into account. Next slide, please. So um, SIDS um, experience many challenges to environmental governance. Um, these include, for example, lack of coordination among institutions, having multiple agencies and sectors that are involved um, in the high demand for fresh water use, and management, for example, in many SIDS, agriculture, tourism are some of the competing industries. Um, and there might be a lack of coherence between different water sector plans and physical planning development plans. Uh, <clears throat> there's also one of the challenges I have in terms of the lack of collection and analysis of empirical data on water sector to inform appropriate decision making. And so what we find is that in many cases, states have limited laws and policies that comprehensively address these issues. So water access, the quality, the distribution, the management and risk, and that can adequately mainstream climate change considerations. So how do policymakers know whether existing policies and laws are effective in addressing the range of anticipated climate change risks and hazards related to fresh water? And what provisions or measures should be incorporated in legal and policy frameworks to ensure climate resilient freshwater resources? Next, please. So the good thing is we are not starting from scratch. There has literally been decades of work on freshwater governance um, at the international level um, with bodies such as UNESCO, but also at the regional level. In the Caribbean, you have the Caribbean Water and Wastewater Association, you have the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center. Um, in the Pacific, we have, for example, the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program, and there are a number of other different regional entities that have been working to develop um, plans on sustainable water and water management and deal with the issue of freshwater governance. Um, so when we look at the objectives for laws and policies related to freshwater resilience, um, we want to be able to reduce vulnerability. So examples of vulnerability, um, you know, for population, location of coastal communities, the high water demand, we want to strengthen the capacity and build resilience. So looking at our freshwater regulators and our governance system. And then we also want to be able to prevent and mitigate some of the risks and hazards which have been mentioned. Thank you. Next slide. 
So one of the first things that we need to look at from a overarching sort of view is what principles and concepts can be incorporated in climate change laws and policies. And um, I have produced a list there and by no means am I saying that this is an exhaustive list because there may very well be many principles and concepts um, and tools that can be incorporated in freshwater governance. But these are certainly some of the more well-known, tried and tested um, concepts and principles and tools that can help with freshwater governance. And many of them are very also consistent with um, the international obligations of SIDS. So for example, Article 7.5, of the Paris Agreement, which requires states to acknowledge that adaptation action should follow country-driven, gender-responsive, participatory, fully transparent approach that should take into consideration vulnerable groups, communities, and ecosystems, and guided by the best available science, appropriate traditional knowledge, knowledge of indigenous people, and local knowledge systems, with a view to integrating adaptation into um, the policies and actions where appropriate. Thank you. Next slide. So this is where I want to spend um, most of my um, time talking about some of these actions um, or criteria that can be used or considered in reviewing climate change legislation and policies. So there have been um, there is a useful starting point when looking at uh, reviewing climate change legislation and policies um, the world bank reference guide on climate change legislation has done some work on that um, building on work by the grantham institute and then we can also look at um, some studies the ipcc fifth assessment report which kind of um, has some focus on some of the specificities specificities of sids so one of the things that, um, or one of the first major things that need to be considered is having a long-term target. Um, incorporating quantifiable long-term targets for adaptation in water man management can help states ensure commitment. It can help attract investments in meeting these objectives. And it's a way in which that these objectives, if they're set in a specific law or policy relating to adaptation for, for freshwater um, resources, can help SIDS to attain these long-term targets. Um, in addition to that, having an intermediate or sectoral target is also important. So ensuring that water management is effective in the long term it also means ensuring that it can be easily monitored in shorter time frames. So having intermediate targets and targets within specific sectors is also important. Um, Justin spoke about the importance of having climate change risk and vulnerable assess vulnerability assessments. Um, we know that data collection and risk and vulnerability assessments are critical to informing decision making and identification of highly vulnerable areas to flooding, storm, storm surges, salination, and other types of impacts. And this can enable our governments to do appropriate and future planning. Um, but we know that SIDS face issues with um, lack of climate information. And so having ensuring that we can incorporate appropriate uh, measures to incorporate measures to collect data and be able to use data in decision making is important. Um, so I'm going to I know my time is running. Anil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if you can gonna... summarize in one minute, please. As we I, will, have to wrap. Yeah. I, I will. I will do that. So. Um, national adaptation planning is also important. Having a mandate to prepare national adaptation plans is important. Having specific policy instruments. Um, so having a mandate to prefer, prepare specific policy instruments that look at adaptation and having mechanisms with appropriate enforcement penalties is also important. And then 
Uh, one of the recognitions has been that SIDS, um, a barrier to good governance is a lack of coordination among institutes, institutions. So having um, ensuring that there is an appropriate coordination mechanism within the laws and policies to coordinate activities around the various actors and sectors that are dependent on water use is important. And then stakeholder engagement as well, ensuring that there are built in within these laws and policies, appropriate mechanisms for ensuring that there is consultation among the various um, affected stakeholders. And of course, we can't forget finance, um, which is a huge part of freshwater governance. Um, so Anil, I, I, most of those on the screen um, are there. People can look at them. And um, I'm open to any questions persons may have on any of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for being with us. Uh with this excellent presentation. This is a process, as I said, we are going to implement next year. So we would like to present uh, the policy option as you have presented and we'll collect all the feedback. Without further delay, now we will move to next presentation, which is kind of an outcome of based on those two workshops and which will be presented by my colleague, Dr. Paulina Lopez, who has a master's and PhD in water sciences. Uh, from Montpellier, France, and the MA in international relation uh, with her uh, rich uh, uh, academic uh, background. She will now try to uh, present the findings of those two technical workshops and also present the pathway that we want to implement uh, next year. Paulina, you have the floor. Please consider limited time. Paulina? Thank you very much, Anish. Good morning. Uh, so as we as we saw in the previous presentation, seeds are highly vulnerable to, to the impacts of climate change in general, but in particular to hydroclimatic hazards. So therefore, there is a need to build resilience in seeds, and this implies the policymaking process. So UNESCO, in collaboration with Southampton University, is a developing a study aiming to support seeds in building, building resilience. Next slide, please. So the purpose of this presentation is to talk to you about that study, but I would like to also share with you the initial, uh, the initial findings and the further steps. Next one, please. So the question um, that we would like to answer in this study is facing hydroclimatic hazards in particular, how to increase response capacity and enhance preparedness in seeds. So the study comprises three phases, and at the, at the end of the first phase, where we are today, we expect to have a set of guidelines in order to know how to assess vulnerability in seeds. For that, we have decided to follow three steps, main steps, which is uh, the assessment about the assessment of hydroclimatic climatic hazards, uh, the vulnerability assessment, and the policy gap assessments, giving emphasis, of course, to vulnerability. So um, based on those results, the further step will be to explore resilience pathways. And in this, I will, I will uh, develop more later. And after those phases, we will have a set of guidelines that we will implement in selected case studies uh, in seeds. So I would like to emphasize that this work is a, is a process, is a, is a flexible process, an iterative process, meaning that we can return to previous steps if needed. Next slide, please. So here we are. So the question we asked for the first phase was how uh, to build a vulnerability assessment framework. So how we're doing that? First of all, it's a science-based uh, work, policy-oriented. And for that, we have been doing literature review Workshop with uh, uh, workshops and uh, with expert uh, with experts from seeds and uh, many places, and of course Justin and Daniel have participated because they are collaborating in this study, and of course at events. And now we are in the first level of analysis, which is the the initial findings. And for that, recommendations uh, uh, to assess uh, hydroclimatic hazards, vulnerability, and policy ha uh, ha gaps have been provided in the in the study. Uh, in the studies and and based on them we have we have been exploring a conceptual perspective a conceptual approach 
in which the coming step will be based. Next one, please. So here we are. Um, so this is uh, this slide represents represents um, it's a very it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a summary really um, uh, of uh, what we have been doing until now. Uh, you already uh, saw the presentation of Justin and Danielle, and here on the left there are uh, the main recommendations that they have provided. I will not go into the detail, but what I would like to highlight is that. Uh, the three of them, the study of the hydro, uh, hydroclimatic hazards, um, the vulnerability and the uh, policy gaps, uh, they highlighted common needs and difficulties. And the first one is related to data, availability of data. Uh, for example, um, there is, a, there is a, a lack of data for seeds in the global data sets, difficulties in downscaling to the local scale, and of course, a tremendous need of local data. They all highlighted the dimension of the spatial dimension and the temporal dimension in the context of climate change, the definition of priorities, the capacity building, because to assess vulnerability, we need capacity buildings, building in terms of skills, in terms of funds, in terms of institutions. The stakeholder engagement is very important, and, and maybe most importantly than everything is the involvement of local communities. So in this iterative and flexible process, new questions arose at the end of those, uh, at the end of uh, this uh, preliminary um, uh, stage. For example, are those recommendations adapted to seeds in a context of uncertainty and considered considering that vulnerability is a dynamic process? Is a, is a dynamic process. So what are the lenses that we should we should assess climate vulnerability uh, in seeds? Next one, please. Carolina, you might want to finish in one minute, please. Yes. So climate change is impacting uh, several spheres, the natural environment, but the social, ecological, the social, economic, and political uh, spheres, of course. It has uh, big repercussions. And this is uh, spreading out uh, uncertainty, not only in terms of climatic variability, but in all the spheres of society. So, so what we suggest is that instead of focusing, focusing on vulnerability of populations, which is, which is represented in the frame in this figure. Rather, we focus on the vulnerability of socio-ecological system, which is defined as the complex interactions and feedbacks in between populations or society uh, with ecosystems. So we need to find resilience for that, for the whole system and not one part of it. Next one, please. And this idea of uh, the uh, socio-ecological system plus the resilience approach led us to the masterpiece for us for resilience, which is water. And according to Farke Marketal, water has roles and functions. And among those roles, so water is a, a source of resilience, is an agent, agent of change, but the victim of change too. And um, considering all the functions, water maintain ecosystems. So is the terminant for the ecosystems, is interlinked with all the process of socio-ecological systems, etc. I will not go into the detail. So therefore, what are we are suggesting today is that is to propose achieving resilience in seed through water. Next one, please. So the implementation and development of this approach is very challenging, of course, because it's very innovative, completely innovative. Very, very in face with the climate change, uh, uh, of course, but very innovative. And those challenges are they require a paradigm shift, um, uh, interdisciplinary skills, to to incorporate non-traditional uh, data sources, to break to break the ice in between communities and science, etc., etc., etc. The the list is long. However, UNESCO feels um, feels can cope with this challenge through its um, uh, interdisciplinary, um, uh, interdisciplinary expertise, the, uh, its collaborative networks, and of course, its high commitment, um, its high, high commitment with seeds, and particularly through the intergovernmental, intergovernmental hydrological program and its ninth phase strategy in which, uh, in which holistic approaches, interdisciplinarity, hydro, hydro, uh, social hydrology, and seeds, of course, are at the core of the strategy. Thank you very much, Anil. Thank you, Paulina, for making excellent uh, pathways with work in progress, but summarizing how we are going to implement. Uh, and, and this is, of course, uh, under discussion, and we will also present next week uh, 
here in Paris during the side event. Thank you very much, Paulina. We will go directly to the panel session. We have an excellent composition of panel today. Um, we have uh, Dr. David Sear from University of Southampton. Uh, we have um, Roger Pulwarti from NOAA Physical Science Laboratory. Um, uh, for, for, uh, and and uh, atmospheric research in Boulder, Colorado. Thank you very much for sacrificing your early hours. We have uh, Karuna Rana uh, from, uh, uh, I, uh, we, we have uh, Karuna Rana uh, from uh, SEEDS Youth, uh, AIMS hub, a youth-led non-governmental organization focusing on advanced implementing youth-led sustainable development. And we have Kushum, Atu Korala, uh, who is an uh, uh, activist and also community water practitioner. We've been working with her for many of the water projects. And so without further delay, I would like to ask each of the panelists, based on the presentation that we have just heard, I would like to first go with uh, David. Um, David, how can we improve our understanding of climate hazard faced by seeds, particularly coastal and fluvial floods in the context of climate uncertainty. If you can respond in three minutes, please. Brilliant. Thanks very much, uh, Anil. Um, and, and thank you, speakers. That was that was excellent. Um, I think, first of all, uh, we've got to remember that flooding and droughts are natural processes um, and that actually uh, it's as much as well the movement of people and infrastructure into areas uh, that are hazard prone that creates the risk as well. Um, and we've also got to understand and that uh, uncertainty is always going to be with us, uncertainty in the data, uh, and therefore our decision making uh, will have uncertainty with it, which means moving forward, we're always going to need some sort of adaptive approach. Um, Justin and the others have mentioned that one of the two challenges is the diversity of small islands um, within SIDS, and this diversity poses challenges. One is the, um, uh, it, it, it sort of causes problems for overgeneralization, um, but it also causes problems from trying to learn from very detailed site-specific case studies. What's the transferability? But the good news is that there's uh, a, an explosion in um, high-resolution data from um, remotely sensed platforms um, and increasingly efficient modeling tools. And that's uh, enabling us pro uh, progressively to drill down to the sorts of levels and scales that are going to be SIDS relevant. But to address the question specifically, Anil, um, I think there are sort of five key areas we can improve. Um, one is in the underpinning science and modeling of flood and drought processes, particularly at SIDS relevant scales. Um, so how do we downscale from our GCM outputs, for example? Secondly, improved measurements of topography and bathymetry of small islands, because these are what help constrain our estimation of hazard exposure um, within them. And I think there's a real challenge here for the global community to ensure that these aren't hidden behind paywalls and restrictive licensing. Thirdly, improved measures of the receptors of hydroclimate, particularly the infrastructure and populations exposed to these, but also I think the new ways, finding new ways to measure the vulnerability at um, small island and sub-island uh, level it poses a real challenge uh, in, in undertaking this sort of approach. We need better understanding and awareness uh, and protection of existing natural capital and the ecosystems themselves, um, because these actually have a, a role to play in uh, mitigating some of the effects of uh, climate change. And then finally, and sort of linked across the whole of these, is a need for capacity building at local to national scale within SIDS. Thank and you very much, David. I have to stop you. This that's is very okay. high prominent point. I want to go to the next panelist immediately in order to not to lose time. Uh, if there will be opportunity, I'll come back to you. Kushum, I want to come to you. What would be the mechanism to integrate local communities in the science and policy making processes? Um, in the context of uh, hazard faced by seeds, uh, very briefly, 
Thank you very much, Anil, for inviting me. And I'm speaking with two hats, community water practitioner and my former hat as academic. I believe that an urgent set of prioritized actions to set up participatory planning platforms, PPP, in affected areas is essential at this point. Most disaster management agencies and systems work on parallel lines. Therefore, setting up the platforms and partnerships for actors with complementary skills have to happen before the crisis occurs. We don't need responses after the event. We need that preemptive action. Creating these platforms, breaking the silo approach, the partnership of getting to know each other, uh, you know, complementary skills, building trust, it takes a lot of time, energy and patience, and most importantly, funding. It calls for high level decision making and advocacy programs for political decision makers to support the relevant changes in the, in the laws. Many of the SIDS have undergone a colonial experience, and I still have to contend with outmoded colonial laws, which act as a barrier to participatory mechanisms. Academics carrying out and, uh, uh, research is important, but they need to interface and build citizen science programs where the community is much a trainer as the trainee. Civil society is also important for planning platforms, but both the community and the civil society need to have skills training and capacity building. And most important, together they have to become a conduit to reach out and support women as positive agents of change and not merely victims of, of climate change. Thank you, Christian. Finally, We have got some key messages now. Yeah. So I have to cut such you because of pressing uh, time. Uh, I will come back to you if our time allows. I will go to Karuna now. Karuna. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kusum. Sorry for uh, cutting you off in the middle. How the youth network created can contribute to overcome challenges in address, assessing vulnerability of uh, hydroclimatic hazard in seas. Thank you and hi everyone. So human resources are one of the key assets of SID and as such we should be giving um, capacities and trusting them, um, uh, trusting young people in being crucial in assessing and addressing um, this issue. So we see ourselves as being able to contribute in three uh, key ways. Firstly, we can help tackle any technocratic barriers to youth engagement by setting up programs that make hydroclimate hazards, um, uh, science and policy more accessible um, simpler and in a youth-friendly language. This would include training them to be effective advocates in this area. We've already successfully done that for climate change issues through some of our projects. Uh, the second way is we would be um, closely linked to, since we are closely linked to schools and academia, young people can lead and be involved in citizen science initiatives to help access data from communities most impacted. And thirdly, we can go beyond just the assessment of these hazards. Young people are creative and entrepreneurial as such we can tap into um, the young people's creativity to give them the opportunity to design solutions that tackle hydroclimatic hazards and help them implement them. Um, last thing to end this, I would um, I would like to say with any other program, with, with all programs of this type, we would love to have support in terms of financing opportunities and also collaboration in project design and implementation, including policy and decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Karuna, for keeping time very efficiently. Kusum, I would like to come back to you after Roger. I know you wanted to finish with the final word, so don't, uh, uh, don't stay online. Uh, Roger, I want to come to you uh, as, a, as a hydroclimate expert. Um, how are these global agenda, particularly Sendai Framework and Paris Agreement, uh, can align the challenges in the context of data uncertainty, data problem resolution that we have just heard about? Very briefly. Right. Yeah, you bet. Okay, thanks, Anil. So aligning the different aspects of things we've seen in, in um, the Sendai Framework, in the IHE Biodiversity Goals, with the um, Paris Agreement and so on. There are a couple of key areas, right? The enhancement of international cooperation with developing countries and especially SIDS through the support to complement their national actions and to substantially increase the availability and access of multi-hazard early warning system as these affect infrastructure and development. As we think through some of these and what you've heard, we have some limitations on web services accessibility, 
being accurate about the exposure elements, understanding that static exposure of electrical grids and infrastructure does not represent people's capabilities to respond to disasters. They're extremely important. But most critically is that link between DRR and climate change adaptation, especially in places islands, such as islands where I'm from, where the information is not actually reliable at the local levels, but there's poor and there's poor representation of ground conditions. So what is needed is actually work across the board, WMO and others, on high resolution global models, not just downscaling. I mean, dynamically consistent global models. There are some examples, such as the link to open data for global disaster risk research, a lot of work in the Caribbean uh, through the five Cs, as you heard, the Caribbean Climate Center and others. Um, and collaborations through GEO as well. And the Caribbean created the early warning information systems across climate timescales to do exactly this alignment. The challenge remains is the difficulty of keeping the long view. There's fragmented responsibilities, different funding structures, and most critically, lessons on the appropriate use and data availability. And I see water as the thread, just as was discussed, across all of these agreements because there's a temporal mismatch between disaster risk reduction and climate, and, and climate change adaptation. So translating the information into technical deliverables, maintain a reliable technical deliverables, moving beyond just vulnerability as static risk, but capabilities and the vertical and horizontal integration. To wrap up, investing in more science and data, data along all pieces of those as a red thread, but most critically is to shift the way of thinking from simply focusing on water infrastructure and building that towards delivering water services when nature-based solutions are systematically considered. And those are in all of the agreements. So pulling out the threads for water, I think, is critical in the science behind it. Thank How's you that? very much. Water okay. is the thread, Roger. Thank you very much. That's for right. <laughs> Uh, excellent uh, ending uh, panel intervention. I want to go back to Kusum to uh, present your final uh, important point, Kusum. Well, uh, I think uh, what I have to say was said better by Abba. Money, 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 always handy. It's a rich man's world. And, I, you know, mobilizing these participatory platforms, it calls for this thing that we are always talking in 26, the funding. And we need to understand that unless we have funding, we cannot do the capacity building, the training, the regulatory changes in the regulatory framework. So my last message is to the billionaires who spend a lot of millions for 11 minutes of free fall in space, look down on the vulnerable people of the SIDS and give them the equivalent for their urgently needed adaptation measures. Thank you. Thank you, Kusum. I hope the negotiators in Glasgow will listen that the funding priority needs to be made to the vulnerable. Otherwise, it will remain as a big talk. Uh, with those uh, key messages that we have taken, as I said, it's a process and we are going to continue to work on the framework. Uh, and I would like to invite you as a follow-up of this session, we will have exactly after one week on 16th of November during UNESCO's 41st uh, general conference session, we are going to have a sit session and you all are welcome to join. Uh, we will circulate the link of course of the event, but you can find also in the UNESCO website. And with that, uh, you know, we have got lots of uh, feedback in our framework processes, uh, which we started with University of Southampton. I have taken note, for instance, citizen science, data resolution, the challenges presented by, uh, by Justine, but also by David, our uh, immense opportunities, uh, uh, the presented by Daniel about the responses uh, needed uh, in the policy. We have a youth voice, we have heard, and also, from Roger's uh, statement that water is the thread, and that's why intergovernmental hydrological program will implement. With that, I would like to thank all of you, our co-organizer, University of Southampton, uh, the panelists, the speakers, and, and my colleague, Paulina, who led uh, this event, together with all the colleagues from, from UNESCO's uh, intergovernmental hydrological program who stood behind, uh, particularly Rita, um, uh, Benjamin, Mahmoud, and Santal, Khorke, and Barbara, and, and Hong, uh, as well as the director who find time to attend despite the general conference to give opening remark. And again, I would like to invite you, 2 p.m. today, we will have a session in the water pavilion
please come back to us on the climate resilient water management approaches. And with that, thank you very much.